Well, greetings, dear friends. It's good to have you with us once again on the Monday Night Open Forum. These sessions are being brought to you through the Midwest Center for Truth here just outside of Leslie, Arkansas, in the Ozark Mountains, in the northwest part of the state. And uh, these sessions and all of our sessions are a ministry of the CMI Bible Research Center, which is here on campus, and these are a production of the CMI Audio and Video Network System, being brought to you just now through Ustream and also YouTube. So we welcome you uh, who are viewing this uh, session live, and if not live, then many of you uh, will be viewing it as a recorded session. Uh, whether you view it live or recorded, we want to remind you that the open part of the open forum is you. And we, we love to hear from you, your questions, your comments, your emails, something you may want us to search out or at least make comments upon or uh, explain uh, what we mean when we are saying a certain thing. Whatever it is, we certainly invite you in a participation. We love to receive uh, emails that are sharing uh, with us uh, the truth that we have been sharing and dealing with during these, uh, during these times. Uh, so, uh, it, it, this, this, whole, this whole session is meant to involve you and I just want to urge you again and state again, your involvement is more than welcome. So may the Lord bless you. Tonight, we're going to be uh, talking about a word that is very prevalent in the scripture. And it is a word that... Under that 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 defines our relationship, or it adds a dimension of definition to our relationship with Christ. And we've looked at it in some degree uh, on these sessions. I'm not for sure just now which one. But we, we, we didn't carry it out uh, maybe as we should have. The word is in the King James Version is hope. H-O-P-E, hope. But the word as translated in the New Testament from the Greek is expectation. And that expectation has several things bound up with it. It has a certainty bound up with it. It has a seeing and a knowing bound up with it. Uh, and, and, and as it is truly set forth in the scriptures, as I have said, it is a very necessary dimension of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to read, we'll, let me read some verses and that will get us started. Uh, Brother Jimmy Collins is uh, with us uh, tonight, and uh, so uh, in Ephesians, Ephesians the first chapter, and we'll just look at verse, uh, let me see, we'll 
We'll look at verse 18, I believe it is. Yes, verse 18. Verse 18. Paul is praying for the church and he is praying for the church as, as he always does. We could look at this in chapter 1 here. We could see it in chapter 3. We could see it in chapter 4. We could see it in every chapter. But he, he really brings it to a point here and in chapter 3 and then also again in, in, chapter, in chapter 4. When Paul is praying for the church, it is always concerning the understanding of their union with the indwelling Son of God. Concerning their union with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the union he is speaking of is Christ in you. The hope of glory. When the term in Christ is used. And it's used a great deal in the New Testament. I mean a great deal. And when the word in Christ is used, many translators and commentators uh, uh, interpret it as in union with Christ. I believe that to be a true interpretation. In Christ, in union with Christ. It's certainly not you and I being in Christ like Jimmy and I are in this room tonight in union with Christ. And of course, we have that union with Christ. And this is the second, this is the thing that's important to, to this word, expectation. We have that union with Christ through His dwelling in us. He brings the union that we have with Him. He brings it about through His indwelling Spirit. Christ in you, the believer. And all of Paul's epistles are with regard to that union. The union that we have with Him as those who are in Him in union with him, that union being brought about by Christ dwelling in us. He initiates, he brings into being that very union. And the word hope, the word expectation, is very necessary to and very much defines a certain dimension of that union. So the verse says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope that you may know what is the expectation of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and it goes on. We're focusing on what is the hope of his Calling. Now, there, there's a, the, the NIV version of the Bible, which is most all of these versions, and there's I don't know how many of them, are, uh, they are translations 
Now let me see, that's not the word. They're translations, yes, and most of them are translations from the Greek. But they are, um, what do I want to say? They are uh, reversions of the King James Bible. The King James Bible is pretty much the standard of, of which these translations are revisions or uh, you could say a reversion but it's a revision and it, it, it is and so it uses the word hope but it trans it translates it uh, expectation but here's the way it reads I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the expectation to which he has called you. Uh, now, uh, that, that's, um, that's not one of my favorite revisions. Uh, because I really think this, the expectation of his calling uh, I wrote down in, in I wrote something down here and I'll read it to you. He is the one who has called us and that calling is with expectation. The expectation of his coming or his appearing in his glory the same as is stated in Colossians 1 verse 26 through 29 he has called us into expectation that is his calling is with great expectation and it is with certainty it is with sureness and certainty. So uh, the, the, the revision is not really different than the King James uh, as it is worded. Uh, but but the, the thing that I was thinking about is the wording of the King James uh, I like better because of the emphasis here that you may know what is the expectation of his calling, that you may know what is the expectation of the calling wherewith ye are called of God. Now, if we want to say that you may understand the expectation unto which he has called you, all right, but I think that the calling is not so much unto the expectation as it is a calling that is bound up with great expectation, that understanding uh, that in understanding the calling that you may know that you may know what is the expectation of his calling we could go ahead and say that is of the calling with which he has called you it is his calling by which he has called you what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints what is the expectation of his power so you see it's his calling and yet it is a calling that that brings with it a great expectation now the expectation that we are looking at here and that the scripture set forth as being the hope 
whether it's the hope of glory or the hope of this calling or the hope of our salvation or the hope of the blessed union of Christ and the church, that expectation has to do with his appearing in his body. It has to do with his coming, but the word coming there has to do with the word perusia in so many of these cases, probably all of them, that are linked up with expectation. Perusia, which means his presence, but it means two things. In the Greek, it means a revealed, yes, a revealed and a manifest presence. It means a presence that cannot be made manifest until that presence is revealed. And it also is always speaking of the presence of the person of Christ himself. That is, it's speaking of the coming of Christ, not the coming of a thought about Christ, not the coming of a truth about Christ, not the coming of a teaching about Christ. Those things all may be a result of the coming of Christ, the appearing of Christ, the revealing of Christ, but the revealing is of Christ himself so that you see he becomes the substance of our hope. And that brings us, that's going to bring us into looking at the faith of the Son of God. Obviously not all of that tonight. The faith of the Son of God. Why? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. The expectation that is set forth in the Old Testament is understood to be that that hope, that expectation finds its substance in faith. But it is the faith of the Son of God. And the faith of the Son of God is a result of that Son being revealed in you. So all of these are the same. But unless we get so scattered out tonight, let's just look at the word expectation and see in the scripture uh, what it is actually talking about. Uh, Jim? The, um, one of the things I was thinking about when you were talking, is even in the last couple of statements concerning the expectation that was set forth in the Old Testament. Yes. The, ex- the expectation. And really, it because they were not born again because Christ had not, you know, offered himself as a sacrifice, died, been buried, and raised as the resurrection. Though the expectation was there, it could never, in in the Old Testament, it could never truly be realized because even in Hebrews, it says... You know, from afar, they saw the promises from afar. It was always from afar. Uh, Abraham saw the place from afar. Three days, but from afar. And the expectation has, has been there since the beginning. You know, when, when God creates the soul, He creates it with expectation. And as I stated, that expectation could not be realized until the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And at that moment, those who were asleep in, in that very expectation, I think it's in one of the Gospels, is Gospels it says they came forth after his resurrection. You know, that's when it was realized for them. But for the born-again believer, which because of the death, burial, and resurrection... It is an expectation to be realized, like now, not. And I was looking at a couple different verses with with the term hope. They one of one of the ways they say it. uh, I was looking at the vines. It says favorable and confident expectation. Yeah. Perfect wording. Favorable. Yes. Confident. Yes. A sure thing. A sure expectation. A sure hope. Because it's, it's from God himself. 
but then he, he, he went on to say it has to do with the unseen of the natural eye, of course, what cannot be seen with the natural eye, but then he throws this out, and the future. Well, uh, yes and no. No, because the future, it's always something afar off, yet to come, just like the Old Testament. No, no, that we're, not in that, we're, we're not in that time anymore. It is, it's no longer Old Testament time. It is the New Testament, Christ himself being that covenant given of, given of God. And I like to look at it in this sense, not so much that someday, yet like, like the verse reads, whenever the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Not someday, eventually, it will maybe possibly come. No, no, no. It is a whenever that takes place, the veil is taken away. So then it is a confident expectation. It is a favorable expectation. And yet, for the born-again believer, it should be realized now. Amen. Uh, with regard to Israel, as, as Jimmy was speaking, uh, in Colossians 1, and uh, 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 from about verse 26 all the way through verse 29, but uh, Paul gathers it up in, in a sentence by saying, uh, the, that you may know the riches, the riches and the greatness uh, of the mystery, because he's there speaking of the mystery, uh, which is Christ in you. the expectation of glory. Uh, Israel had great expectation, as, as, we've, as we've said. Israel had great expectation of glory. I mean, glory was given to Israel in all kinds of types mm. and shadows. Uh, most particularly, it was introduced at Sinai. Because Moses had asked to see the face, of, had asked to see the glory of God. And, and, and God told him that, that he could not see his, see his face. Uh, because to see the face of God is to see his glory. And don't, don't imagine a face like my face or your face, but the front of God, the, the, the appearing of, of God, the person of God is really the person of God, the face, the person uh, of God. While, while you can see his wonders, see his miracles, see his this, see his that, Israel did but not the person. And that's because that is bound up with glory. You cannot see, you cannot see God and not see his glory because the seeing of him, the seeing is bound up with light, having the light. And the light is bound up with glory because the glory is the light. Uh, and, and, and so many more things are bound up with that, but he says, you can't do that now, but I'll show you the lesser. I'll show you my hinder parts, which was the lesser glory. Uh, and and, and, and uh, Moses, even seeing that, his, his whole skin uh, was shining uh, outwardly, outwardly. And, it, and, and Israel was afraid of him. So they wanted him to, they, they put a veil over his face. They didn't want to see that anymore, nor did they want to hear the words of God anymore. They were, 
they were afraid. Uh, and then that veil is taken into the temple and the glory is there. But here's the point. The expectation is always bound up with the appearing. The appearing of the one who is there. The seeing the glory of the one who is there. You can't see the glory of the one who's not there. Mm -hmm. And it was on the mountain, it was the same, and, and, and Moses couldn't see him in the way he wanted to see him. And yet, Paul brings that over into the reality of our union with Christ uh, everywhere, but, but classically, in uh, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, he just gets right to it. This, this Moses and this glory and this veil over the face of Moses and this veil that is up in the tabernacle. Uh, Paul says in the first place, this glory uh, was the glory of that which was coming to be abolished, that which uh, was coming to its determined end. And Israel would not, did not want to look to that end. And, and so a veil was put over the face of, uh, of Moses and, and uh, and then he says that glory uh, was glorious of that administration, was glorious indeed, but it was made not glorious at all by the glory that excelleth. And there it's very clear he's taught that glory is Christ himself. And then he says that the, that the old glory had a veil connected with it it had a veil connected with it but that the the glory that excelleth does not have a built-in veil or a veil that is connected with it uh, he says the veil that veil of the old was done away in Christ and yet he does say as, as Jim was saying that 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 in reading the scripture the, that same veil that, that, that hid the glory from them, though it was a lesser glory, but that same veil is yet upon the heart. Uh, which veil is done away in Christ? And it says if the heart or when the heart, and, and that's the word that Jim was using, whenever, whenever. And I thought about that, and I went through all that to say this. I thought about that, uh, as Paul relates it to us uh, still in the, in the epistle to the Colossians in Colossians 3 where he says uh, seeing then if ye be seeing then that you be risen with Christ and better versions say risen and seated with Christ uh, because it's pointed back to Ephesians in the heavenly places, but seeing that you are risen with Christ, seek, seek the fullness that is there. Seek the reality that is there. Uh, set your heart, set your mind, set your the gaze of your soul, not upon the things on the earth, but the things which are above. And that's not above or far off, as Jim said. That has nothing to do with being far off. It is, it is the things that are heavenly and not earthly. That's what that's talking about. The difference between actually the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Uh, why? Why? Why should you set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth? Because as to all of that, and more than just to all of that, but gathering all of that up in it, you are dead. And your very life is hidden in Christ, in God. And then here's our word. And when he who is our life, whenever, 
And whenever, that's a true translation. Jimmy spoke of it. Whenever he who is our life shall appear. There the word is appear. In one of the places it is it is coming, but it's translated from the Greek word apocalypse, which means revealed. It's the same thing, the revealed person. When he who is our life shall appear. Then, not until then, then, a good translation is then, you shall know yourself as being with him in glory. You shall see that you are with him in glory. You shall understand your union with Christ. When Christ who is your life is revealed in you. Now, what is the expectation that Paul gives there? Uh, not that Christ would come and be in you, but the expectation is his appearing, the appearing of the glory. In other words, the revealing of the glory. The revealing. Uh, God hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. When? When? Whenever he appears. Whenever he appears. The expectation of our soul is in his appearing. He who is come to appear. Uh, you know, Jim, I think that the life of the believer is meant to be a life of great expectation. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. It's, it, that's exactly it. From, from the very get-go, uh, God creates the soul with purpose, with expectation. Yeah. And I, I love the way you said that. Um, I can't remember when you mentioned it, but it is the appearing of Him who is present. Yes. And that is the key word, present. And yeah. see, I, 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 I've said it several times this way. God reveals His Son where He is. If He's not in the soul of a person, He cannot reveal His Son. He's just not there. So the soul is still created with that expectation. Yeah. Therefore, the soul must be born again. At the moment of new birth, Christ appears in the soul. He appears the first. He appears in the soul. And yet he appears in the soul at the moment of new birth and that expectation does not end. Because now, and you, and you mentioned it a while ago, now the expectation is still there in the soul that he may appear the second apart from sin unto the salvation of the soul. Unto the soul realizing its salvation. Now, when the, when the person's born again, now God the Father can reveal Him who is present. And that is the issue when it, when it comes down to it. That is the, oh, the issue, the matter. That is the matter. Is that He is present and is he is the one being present or excuse me is the one who is present being known being that's it being continuing continuing and it, it is a continual thing it's it's not a one time thing because it's i love this the way you've been sharing it here recently 
it's not a message you're laying hold of. It's not a teaching you're laying hold of. It's not a religion you're laying hold of, but a person. Amen. A very person, the very life of our soul. And it, it's, you can even look at it in the natural. You can't have a relationship with a person when you see them once a year. That's really not, you don't know them. When that happens, that's no. called an acquaintance. That, that's not a relate. You, you don't know them. You don't know them. Yes. And, and it's, it's always like that. For the one who is born again, that expectation is now to be realized because he is there. He must be seen. He must be known um, <clears throat> because he is present. And I, I love, uh, I love, and, and this, is, this is the end of all ministry. This is the goal of all, of all the ministry of God. I won't say the ministry of man, but the ministry of God has one goal and one end in view. And you, you, can, you can wrap it up with, with one man, actually with all the apostles. But I like, I like the, way, the way it's seen with John the Baptist. You know, they come asking John, okay, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you the anointed of God? Yeah. No, I am not the Christ. I love that confession. No, I am not the anointed of God. I, not I, you know. And then they keep on asking him, okay, well, why are you baptizing? Why are you doing what you're doing? And his response is simply this. There is one in the midst whom you do not know, but that he may be made manifest yeah. Therefore, am I come baptizing in water? Therefore, am I doing what I am doing? With the end in view, the goal in view, that he may be, mani be made manifest, the one who is in the midst. Amen. And, and I love that because he is governed by the very expectation of God. And I love it. Because if you, if you read way, the verses way before that, starting out like in John all this is like in John chapter 1 and 3 through in there. But at the very beginning, when it starts talking about John the Baptist, it says this, there was a man sent of God. Yeah. And the man sent of God bears God's expectation unto the rest. Amen. He has no other, I mean, he, if he's sent of God, then he has the mind of God. He's governed by the will of God, the mind of God. He, he's governed by the expectation of God, the purpose of God. So I just love that there. And, and it's not, um, I mean, in, even with John the Baptist during that time, it was still like outward. And yet the testimony of it is there. The order of it is there. You know, the, and it is a spiritual testimony. Because as in, as in the Old Testament, You'd mentioned it, you know, Moses went up, went up to Mount Sinai. He had a glory that was fading, just like, just like when he saw the Lord. He saw the back of the glory that's leaving. And that's the way it was in the Old, in the Old Testament. I mean, they had the tabernacle, yes, and the beautiful testimony of, of, of the reality of Christ. They had the temple, and yes, a beautiful testimony of the reality of Christ. And yet, the testimony is from 2 Corinthians, considered not even glorious compared to the glory of the person, of the reality of the person himself. Because in the Old Testament, the glory would come and fill, and then the glory would leave. Okay. And it would come, and it would go. It is not so in the New Testament. The Lord continues. The, once the Lord appears, hey, he is in his house, and he remains he remains. Um, just recently, I was uh, listening to some reading of the scripture, but it's from, from a, a translation that I like a, a whole lot, and I can't even think of the translation name, but, but here's the verse. It's, it's, it's in, um, I love this, it's, it's in John, I think it's like chapter 15, the vine and the branches, but, but the way it reads is, Jesus says this, continue in me, as I am continuing in you. Mm. Yeah. So right. where's the reality? I am continuing in you, therefore your heart ought to be continuing in me, yeah. just as, even as I am continuing in you. Yeah. And that's the whole thing about setting your affection on that which is above. 
on him who is above. Because Christ is found in the soul of the believer, but we will never behold it with a natural eye. And if we are trying to behold it with a natural eye, then our affection is on that which is below because the natural senses are limited to the natural creation, that which is below, not above, not, not outside of the natural creation. And that's, that's, always, that's always the case. To behold Him who is present, there must be a lifting up of the eyes. And then, then when the... When, when, and the eyes of the heart. It's not the eyes of the, the, the natural eyes because there's a beautiful testimony of that even in the Old Testament. You know, even, even when Moses would go meet with God and the glory of God would appear, everyone on the outside only saw a cloud. They couldn't see what was on the inside. It, it was veiled to them. They could not see. They, they did not know. And yet Moses did because he was there with the Lord. But um, for that to happen, for us who are born again, you read it in uh, Colossians 3, it's the symbol turning the affection of the heart above. And really, it's what, what it comes down to, it's the Lord drawing our attention out from the earth, out from the natural realm, out from that which is not faith, out from that which is not faith unto him unto beholding by faith him who is present. And I love, yes, I'll go back with Abram. <laughs> I, I, I love just recently where, where I've been with Abram uh, and the Lord, mainly the Lord in, in excuse me, Genesis chapter 15. It says, the Lord brought Abram out. He brought him out of the whole natural realm, the whole literal, physical earth, the Lord brought him out. And he says this, lift up now your eyes Amen. and behold the heavens. It's, he, he brings him out that he might behold the increase of Christ, that he might behold the resurrection. Well, the Lord is always seeking to do that bring us out that he may show himself mm -hmm. the problem is that so many will simply not do that uh, they won't they won't come out they, they, they will not and all of that even with Abraham you could call all of that out from which he had to come a veil uh, you know, and and that's what it represents. Now we were talking about the expectation of which God created, with which God created the soul, and uh, very pointedly and very truthfully, uh, the expectation is Christ Himself. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about that. And when we are born again, Christ is in us. And, and to some degree, there is a reality of that, uh, you know, in, in our soul. Uh, Jim was saying he appears the first time, and, and that is true. Unfortunately, most folks have never gone in their understanding uh, beyond that appearing mm -hmm. uh, the first time. And, and I only say that to say this. Uh, so, much, so, many, so many in the church world are trapped in that, that first appearing. Jesus come to save my soul and, I'm, you know, and he's my life and so forth. But then the word hope comes in. And so they say, well, the hope has not yet been fulfilled. The expectation is one day in heaven we will see him. Now, am I not right? I mean, 
countless doctrines are woven all around that. Come on, friends, am I not right? And yet, the reality is that Christ is in you. But how does, how do I as a soul born from above, a soul in whom Christ by his own eternal spirit as the person of my salvation lives in me. How, how do I know that? Oh, I feel good and I this and that and people tell me I know it and, and then they give me 50 things to do and how to go to church and, and all of that. You know that you know what's done. Now I'm saying how and so the expectation of my soul in that condition is not satisfied. Not satisfied in me. Because I'm wanting to see him. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to be where he is and I'm wanting to be everything I read in the Bible. If I really am hungry after salvation, then that's what I'm, I'm after. And, and, and the whole Christian religion and the theology of it is saying, well, it, it, it's not so yet. It's... It's still in the future. It's still... And so the whole thing is, we, we, in our mind, we think hope is in the future. But hon, what we're trying to tell you tonight is that hope is in, is fulfilled in Christ who is in you. But how is that hope, that expectation fulfilled in your heart? It's not, it is fulfilled in your heart because Christ is in you, because it can't be fulfilled except Christ be in you. But it's fulfilled in your heart through Christ who is in you being revealed to your soul. Yes, in your soul to the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope of his, the hope of your salvation, the hope of the calling wherewith you are called of God, the hope of it. Let's say God has called you unto the fullness of his Son. Let's say that God has called you unto what Paul says, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is the expectation of that calling? Seeing Christ. Because how is that calling fulfilled in your soul? Through the appearing of Christ. Through him showing himself to be the answer to your soul, the salvation of your soul, the purpose of your soul, the life of your soul. Not by him just being that in his person, but by him showing that to you. By, because one of the, a lot of these, these words that mean the revelation of Christ, the coming of Christ, has to do with, has to do with the word light. And, and one of the definitions is showing himself to be. And that's what happens when Christ is revealed in you. He shows himself to be. He shows himself to be. That is, he is the light of the glory of God. So he shows himself to be the glory of God in you. He is the substance of salvation. He shows himself to be your salvation. He shows himself to be mm -hmm. the resurrection. He shows himself to be your life. He shows himself to your soul because he dwells because he dwells in your soul. He shows himself to be who he is. Thus, your expectation is in the process of coming to faith. What this is, hope cometh and findeth substance in faith. All right. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of, of, of hope. 
Faith is the substance of our salvation. What, what, what are we, what, we have said all of that. In all of our words, we've said that tonight. Christ shows himself to be the substance of your salvation. The substance of your life. The person of it. The word person means substance in the scripture. He shows himself to be the very substance of it. What results in your soul as the appearing of Christ has what result in your soul? What results in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining in the faith of Jesus Christ? What results? What is the result of seeing Christ? Knowing Christ, yes. Having the knowledge of Christ, what is the result? Faith. The faith of the Son of God is the result. The faith of the Son of God. Faith My God, true faith embodies the substance that Christ is. Mm -hmm. No wonder Paul says, every day I live, I live in the faith of the Son of God. My, my. Jim was talking about end. That is the thing that is set before us. When you have time, read First Peter. Noting First Peter chapter 1, noting verse 9 and verse 13. Verse 9 says, verse 9 says, the end of your faith even the salvation of your soul. And then he continues with that thought to verse 13. To verse 13. Let me see what verse 13 says. To verse 13, 13, 13. Wherefore, gird, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, Jim, I believe this to be expectation. Be sober. I think that is the attitude and demeanor of a person who is in expectation. I don't think I don't think they're in a bunch of foolishness and all of that. I mean, just look at a woman in a hospital fixing to have a baby, or a woman anywhere fixing mm -hmm. to have a baby, and the whole. I mean, all of a sudden, the state of being at that time is one of great <laughs> expectation, yeah. and everybody's pretty sober. Yes. I don't mean sad, I mean sober. Everybody's mm -hmm. focused upon what's going on. They're not telling jokes and doing this and doing that and running all around. It's a sobering thing. And, I, and, I, and, and here's it, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Is that, Jim, is that really any different than set the affection of your heart on things above where Christ setteth at the right hand? You know, I mean... No. gird up the loins of your mind and I'll come back to you in a minute but let me read this be sober and hope expect to the end what is that except receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls expectation is unto the end of knowing him of knowing him. Mm -hmm. And until we come, I mean, that to the end of knowing him, to the to the absolute full goal of knowing him. Knowing him. And it's therefore living. It's living. You said something a while ago, and it meant ever ongoing. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've begun to see that all that is is living, living expectation. 
because yes. it's a living faith. Yes. Because it's a living Lord. Yes. It's, it's living, yes. thank God. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost my track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but it, is, it, it is bound up with, with a person who is living. Who is living. And the hope, you'd mentioned it earlier, it's... I can't remember how you mentioned it earlier. It was like walking in expectation or living in expectation. Of His appearing. Of His appearing. Yes, and, and, and that's it. That is it. That is it. And I think, I think we, get, uh, we get more caught up with, you mentioned another word also, with the results of. Yes. There, there is a myriad of, of results, of effects, yes. when the Lord appears, yes. and I think that's what we get caught up with. And yeah, so, what, what it, exactly what ends up happening is that we're no longer in expectation. We're we're no longer governed by God's expectation, but we're governed by a lesser expectation, man's, yeah. a vain expectation, you know. And yet, the whole expectation is to behold Him who's present who is ever-present since the moment of new birth. And that's, that's, that is literally what it is all about. Everything else falls into place. Everything else is, is, is governed by purpose at that moment. Everything else is governed by the, the, the will and mind of God at that moment. There just, just, uh, I'll, I'll just mention this. Uh, one, of the mo one of the most things that we get caught up with as believers, is trying to serve the Lord, is ministry, is trying to serve the Lord. And um, a really beautiful picture uh, is seen with, you know, Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary, and Martha's caught up with, you know, serving. And the Lord doesn't look down on that. He, he appreciates her, her serving. And yet he, he declares that Mary has chosen the better, but really what has Mary chosen? She's chosen to hear his word, his word that in the order found in the scripture, hearing his word will cause the heart to turn to see the word. Yeah, amen. Will build expectation to behold the word. Amen. You know, and so it, it's, it's no longer... Even with that, it's no longer being caught up with the results or the, the effects of, but being governed by the expectation of God, which is beholding the voice, See, beholding it. the word. See, it is the expectation of God. Yes. And I was thinking as you were talking, see, and, and therefore God's expectation is fulfilled yes. in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so Christ in God's view, in God's understanding, is the full expectation of my soul, that mm -hmm. which he has created the soul for that. But again, we've been discussing on, yes, the expectation is fulfilled in Christ. The expectation is Christ. But how, how does that, how, how then, you know, how is the expectation of my soul, which is Christ, fulfilled? How is that expectation fulfilled in me? Is fulfilled in me through the appearing of Him. Yes. Through the knowing of Him. But we can't know Him unless it is in His yes. appearing. Mm -hmm. Because He is not, it, again, we've been saying that recently. Uh, knowing him is not about knowing things about him or teachings about him or this, that, and the other. No, it, it is him showing himself. Mm. Just think of that. Just think of that. That Because the Father knoweth the Son, the Son knoweth the Father, and no one else does, but because God knows the Son. In absoluteness and fullness, that Son... He has set forth as the expectation, the certainty of his own heart. And 
it is the heart of God to share that expectation, the fullness of it, with our soul, to bring us into his rest, to bring us mm -hmm. into his uh, in, 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 into his into his hope because his hope is finished mm -hmm. his hope mm -hmm. is, is full and, uh, and, 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 and and that is accomplished through so and I'm trying to put down any theological arguments here and I know that our time has already come to an end but we go by that every now and then so what we are absolutely saying is, yes, Christ is the expectation of my soul. And that expectation, which is Christ, is fulfilled in me through his appearing, through his appearing, through his appearing. So the expectation of my soul being then being for him to appear, for him to appear for him to appear. And it's not an expectation based on for him who is afar off to come mm -hmm. and be near. Mm -hmm. No. I, to see him, to see him, yes. to see him, to see him. That becomes, to me, that becomes an anchor of my soul. Not, it doesn't become, you know, an uncertainty. It becomes a certainty of my soul. A certainty. Yes. Uh, and the, the certainty of it is, is it he is present. It be, yes, yes. And that's the, the certainty and, of it. Yeah, and, and see, that's the whole point. Because he is present, mm -hmm. then all of this is true. Yes. Yes. And, uh, but it is in his appearing that, we, that the light of the knowledge of God fills our soul, that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, that the understanding given of God, and all of that, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. How? Not with darkness, but with the light of his appearing. Mm -hmm. Why? That you may know. That you may know the expectation of his calling. The expectation of his calling is found and fulfilled in his appearing. In his appearing. And in that, faith abounds. Faith abounds. Ah, oh my. Faith abounds. But you see, faith is a living faith, so it's always growing. Our expectation is a living expectation because it's in a living Christ. Mm -hmm. All of this is in motion mm -hmm. by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. It all is. And it's a shame because when people put something into a doctrine, they kill the motion of it. Yes. yes. It's just, that and is, you, it has you, no motion. You take the life, it. you take the life. What you do is, is you snap a picture and you treasure the picture. Yes. And there's good, no life in it. Excellent, excellent analogy because that's true. And, and, and you have three words that come into effect past, present, and future with that, say, with a doctrine, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, for anything, uh, uh, because, hon, we say, well, well, present, present, yeah, no, see, present is always passing. Present is ongoing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, with God, eternity is present, see, and our natural mind just has a fit with that. But my point is that when we put something in a doctrine, it's either got to be we're trying to prove it past or yeah. present or future or all of this. And when you see Christ, none of that, none of that is even a thought. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just Him. Him. And, and it's not just that He's... I, I, and I say this because used to, there were people they were teaching and they said, you know, present truth. But I'm thinking, present truth has always been truth, will always be true. Present mm -hmm. truth is yes. eternal. That means it's Christ. You know, because we try to put it in a picture. Yeah. This is present. But by the time you get that said, now what? 
So uh, expectation, my Lord, is a, becomes a, a state of being of our soul because of the certainty of the indwelling Christ. It becomes the anchor of my soul. I know that when I turn to see him, he is there. Oh, hallelujah. And I know that whenever he appears, my union with him appears. My Lord. And how can that help to be? There, there, go ahead. What verse are you looking at there? I was just going to read one verse. It's uh, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope oh, that's exactly and the glorious what appearing <laughs> of the great God and Savior. Good. And uh, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. That's, that's, that's the verse I was looking for to turn to, turn to here. Uh, oh yeah here it is up here I'm glad you I'm glad you read that because I thought I thought that would be a good one to to end with yeah Titus 2.13 there it is I knew I had it here somewhere that's our life mm -hmm. now folks I, I don't. I've, I've tried to promise myself not to even get doctrinal, and not to even to get doctrinal by disputing traditional doctrinal things, uh, because simply because it is doctrinal or traditional does not necessarily mean it's mean, bad, and ugly. But isn't it a shame that we take a verse like this, particularly in the way that Jimmy has just quoted it, and that we've been using it? and take all the life out of it and relegate it to a yet future event that we cannot have even if we want it. Now that, that's not right, brother. I mean, folks, come on. That's, that's not right. That we are, that's, not, that's just not right. You know what I'm thinking of right now? I'm thinking of what we've been talking about. I'm thinking of Moses with all of his heart wanting to enter where he could not enter. We put ourselves in that same place saying, want to all you can, you can't yet see his glory because his glory hadn't yet come. Hon, what's the New Testament all about? What's the New Covenant all about? What's our salvation all about? The glory has not only come, he mm -hmm. is in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As the absoluteness and certainty of the expectation of our soul. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, bless the Lord. I've enjoyed our session and our time with you. And we look forward to continuing these sessions from Monday to Monday, but I tell you, your participation is what really helps. So, let us hear from you. May the Lord bless you. Uh, and, Jim, anything else in closing? Nope, that was it. That, that, verse, was, yep. that verse was a good closing. All right, folks, may the Lord bless. Have a good night. Amen and amen. Jim is... On it. With just the two of us here tonight, he's on his way to the booth to disconnect us. <laughs>